You're listening to The Real Well Show with Kathy Fetke, the real estate investor's resource. Today we have a very special guest back on The Real Well Show. It's been a long time. Rich Fetke, welcome back. Thank you. It's, it's been a while. Good to be here. I can almost hear the crowds cheering like, hey, right. where has he been? <laughs> oh, man, I've we- been on like 30 other podcasts, so... Yeah. I feel like a podca- podcast whore. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Be careful now. Don't bring anything home. Uh, so, uh, so you, well, first of all, you've been busy on other podcasts and radio shows and all over the place because of your new book, The Wise Investor. Yeah, which I heard that the um, pickup uh, delivery truck went to the printers today to pick up the hardcovers to deliver them to the Amazon warehouse. So finally... It's been so interesting. There's a wait list for people who want the hard copy or the hard cover because let's see, that was supposed to come out in March or Uh, August 30th. Yeah. I mean, before that, but then August 30th and then they delayed it again, all the supply chain issues and all that. And then they had water damage of the hardcover stock and all that stuff. But I'm, you know, the, the Kindle version has been doing incredible well, incredibly well. The uh, audible version has been doing even better than that. So I'm really stoked on that. So, but I can't wait to hold the hardcover in my hand. (laughs) A lot of people don't realize that there was a shortage of paper and a lot of authors have had to postpone their books. I think that's partly because uh, something to do with Amazon having so much shipping that they bought like the paper plants or something. And they, they bought a couple of the biggest paper mills in the U S yep. So to, to make their boxes. So yeah, all crazy people, times. <laughs> all you people ordering on Amazon, it, there's no books. <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. But there's audio and you did the wise investor in audio, uh, which can be found on audible and where else? Um, yeah, I mean, audible, any, anywhere where you can get uh, audio books. Um, but yeah, on Amazon through audible and yeah, all over the place. And, and same with the, uh, the Kindles all version is everywhere. And same with the hardcover when that comes out, it should be and, about a week. And for those who haven't heard it yet, um, it's a parable. So it's a story and rich does the narration for it, which means that he does about <laughs> a minimum of 10 different voices, many of them women, um, which is really hard to imagine, but you do a, a heck of a job. <laughs> Thank you. Well, uh, I won't do it now, so I'll, I'll let people listen. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Okay. But I know that's not what we're here to talk about, not about the Wise Investor book. We're here to talk about investor questions and member questions, because we have so many questions that come into real wells with people asking things like, um, how did real wealth get started? How does real wealth make money? What do your investors focus on? Uh, what are your investors doing? So I think that's what we're here to to answer. Yeah. Initially, it was going to be me doing a monologue and it was like, no, 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 no. Let's get rich on here and we'll have yes. a dialogue. Much better. Great. And you can do it in 10 different voices if you want. You feel free. <laughs> okay, let's do this then. Let's go. <laughs> All right. So what's the first question, Mr. Becky? First one we have here, it's, uh, several people have asked, is provide some background on real wealth. When and why did you start it? How has it grown? What does real wealth do to help investors? And how does real wealth get paid? So it's a multifaceted question there. That's but a uh, super long question. Yeah. Yes. Why don't you start with um, how we get started? Okay. Well, for me, it was a desperate attempt to uh, make money, really, honestly. Um, Back in 2003, you had come out with your first book, Extreme Success, and you were traveling the country, uh, promoting that all over national media. It was published by Simon & Schuster, and you got a big advance. We just bought our first house. Mm -hmm. At the time, it was a $4,000, over $4,000 a month payment, which this is 25 years ago, so you could probably say that's close to it over a $10,000 a month payment today. It yeah. was a, it was a big undertaking, but we were really at the top of our game. You had a full coaching practice. Your I, I had been working in the media and in, in newsrooms, but um I was able to be a stay-at-home mom thanks to you with our two young daughters. Mm-hmm. And everything was awesome until you came home from your book tour, noticed a freckle. That freckle got you went Somehow you knew that was a strange freckle. I yeah. checked, turned out to be melanoma. 
Mm-hmm. And then you came home after hearing what the doctor said. So I would love to hear from you what exactly the doctor said. Uh, yeah, I mean, they after they did some surgeries to remove the melanomas in two different places, uh, my doctor suggested that I get a CAT scan um, just to make sure that everything was cleared and it had metastasized and spread. And that CAT scan showed four masses on my liver. So a couple of weeks later, I met with my, it was about a week later, I met with my dermatologist and he said, I don't like the looks of this. I want you to get an ultrasound that showed the same thing, four masses on my liver. And I had to wait several weeks for a PET scan, which is the most advanced uh, scan for cancer. And in that process, I met with an oncologist that my doctor scheduled and he looked at my file and just looked up at me and he said, it looks like it has spread to your liver. Melanoma is an aggressive cancer. There's nothing we can do. And I said, what does that mean? He said, it means you probably have six months to live. And we had a three-year-old daughter, a 10-year-old daughter. It was, it just rocked our world, rocked our life. And in that process, yeah, you were like, what am I going to do if Rich goes, if Rich passes, uh, what am I going to do for an income? And so you're the one who rallied, mm-hmm. got out there and sought out mentors. And you found out them from these mentors that um, real estate investing was a way that you could create an income. And yeah. Yeah, I'm all the one to you continue from there. Yeah, I mean that that was it. Uh one thing I still had was my re- weekend radio show. Uh, I think at the time it was on KNEW. Um then it was on KSFO in San Francisco this was before <clears throat> this was before podcasts existed. Right. And uh and I just thought, well, uh, I could use that. That's one thing I do have, but how do you make money from a a radio show? Well, sponsors. So I just called I started listening to all the sponsors of other shows and I just called those people, but you know, they would say, no, I'm already sponsoring such and such show. We've already spent our marketing budget. So I thought, okay. And at the time it was, um, mortgage brokers because this was 2003, it was the big mortgage boom. So I just went down the list of mortgage brokers in the phone book, which existed then one by one, called them, called them, want to sponsor my show, want to sponsor my show. It was a no, because you know, generally people don't, want to just give you money. <laughs> they don't know you. You don't just call and ask for money. It doesn't work that way. You need to really offer a great benefit. So finally, I was like, what is going to get a sponsor that will pay us money to kind of help us during this time? And I just thought an offer that someone couldn't refuse. The next phone call I made, I said, how would you like to be a star? I will make you my <laughs> co-host on my radio show in San Francisco. And the guy's like, yeah, that sounds great. Come to my office. Let's do it. He wrote the check. And I came home to you and said, oh my gosh, honey, I now have a mortgage show. This is going to kill, kill my reputation. I'm going to lose my audience. I've just sold out. Mm. And you came up with a better idea. You said, why don't you make it human interest and find out what people are doing with these loans? So that's when I went on a mission. I just started interviewing all of his clients, finding out that some were doing, um, you know, fix and flip. Some were doing the buy and hold, own it for two years, sell it, get the $500,000 tax free. Um, you know, uh, because if you're, if you're married, you can get that. I mean, we just learned all kinds of things that people were doing with their loans, investing out of state, buying for cash flow, uh, you know, doing the Burr method, which wasn't really a thing back then, but, or at least that wasn't the name of it, but the buy, um, rent, you know, refi, that, that whole thing. Uh, so we just learned, I just interviewed and interviewed and interviewed successful real estate investors and got hooked. That's how it started. Yeah, which turned us on to real estate investing. Thankfully, that PET scan that I got showed that I was 100% cancer free. It was what they call a false positive. It was just clusters of blood vessels on my liver that is harmless. And, um, but it was enough to look like cancer for that oncologist to give me that diagnosis. But, you know, that was the curse. But with every curse, they say often comes a blessing. And that is what introduced us to real estate investing, mortgages. Kathy became a, licensed agent so she could do mortgages. And then we started to invest. Kathy had, you had um, Robert Kiyosaki on your radio show. And he said, sell your high priced California rentals and get that money out of California and go to Texas. And so you and I went to uh, north of Dallas in a little town called Rockwall. We bought five investment properties and that was our foray into real estate investing. And, um, Don't we just, you know, people from your radio show are saying, how are you doing this? How are you living in the San Francisco area and investing out of state? It was not done that much back then. And it just 
you know, yeah, it was, this is 2003. And then we had uh, friends and family asking us how we were doing it. So that's when we decided to form this little group called Real Wealth, where we could help people, uh, you know, guide them and invest together and help people invest out of state. And that little group that we thought would be small, <laughs> you know, just a small group, a local Rio or something now has over 66,000 members. I think we're at 67,000 members now. So that was the, that was the birth of Real Wealth. And we've helped a lot of people since then, you know, get on the same path. Yeah. So it really just started out with, um, we would forge forth and create our portfolio. And I would talk about it on the show, the Real Well Show. And people would say, oh, I want to do that too. So we would refer them to the property management team we were using and the, you know, the agent that we were using because so many agents didn't understand real estate and they were taking us to all kinds of crazy neighborhoods where the numbers didn't make sense. So it just became really important to protect out-of-state investors with a solid team in a, mm -hmm. in a certain market who could take care of them and understood that there would be consequences if they didn't, because we, as the, the larger we grew as a group, the more we would talk and we'd find out. And, uh, you know, if you, if, if these agents or property managers wanted to stay in business, they would take good care of our members. And that just kept growing and growing. And it's what we're still doing today, uh, going out, venturing out into markets where there's job growth, population growth, the affordability, the same things that Kiyosaki said at the time was so uh, valuable about Texas, um, landlord-friendly laws, uh, infrastructure growth, these types of things that that make where the numbers work and they don't work in the high-priced market. So we still do it today. Yeah. We earn a broker-to-broker uh, -broker fee. Rich, you're, you ended up getting your broker's license. And yeah. um, that's the only legal way to do it, by the way. There are companies who who do these kind of referrals and it's it's not legal if you're not licensed, it has to go from broker to broker. So just make sure um, that you check on that. Yeah. And on the business side of things, we hired a DRE, a department of real estate uh, attorney specialist who used to work at the DRE. And so she's the one that did the full vetting and looking at how it works and came back and looked at the different markets we were in. She's like, all the markets that you're in, you have to be a licensed broker. You can refer to another broker, but you have to have another broker on the other end. And so, yeah, there's a lot of people who were breaking the rules back then, uh, maybe including us, <laughs> but then we learned and we cleaned our act up, but there's a lot of people who are breaking the rules today. You know, another thing to look at on that was this was pre 2008, right? So um, most of those properties were new builds. There wasn't many foreclosures there, you know, it's in that time, that time period, you know, 2003 to 2008. So it was a lot of new builds, people buying these new properties. And then when 2008 hit, all of a sudden, uh, all these foreclosures started to happen and short sales and all that, as, as we all know, a lot of bank owned properties. And so uh, you, Kathy, started to connect with some of these property teams who are finding these foreclosures, fixing them up making them like new or rent ready and putting a tenant in place. So that's when this whole thing with turnkey properties and um, referring to that, it really shifted things. And we really kind of pivoted and changed to, to offer that to our members and then come full circle. Here we come into a new market and then it started to shift into all new builds again, because there was not many foreclosures. And so over the past several years, it's moved to new builds and now we're coming into a new period. So what, what do you see for coming into this new period? Opportunity. That's all I can say. It's like so many people are afraid of what's coming and I'm looking at it like, oh no, this is, this is really the time that investors get to shine. In my opinion, uh, that you really have a lot of, I hate to say it because I would love for everybody to be able to own their own home, but unfortunately with interest rates up, um, Many people have been priced out and they're forced to rent. So it's, in my opinion, a landlord's market right now. You know, there's buyers, sellers markets. This is a landlord's market. Mm -hmm. And that's our business. We help individuals build a retirement through rental property. And, you know, someday rent rates will come back down, I think sooner than later. And then buyers will be back in business and uh, there'll be more competition. But right now, if you've got cash, if you... um you know, a lot of sellers are actually buying points. So your your mortgage rate is around 6%, which may sound high to people, but that's a really normal rate. That's a very, very normal rate. And it's, it's something lower than the rate when we started investing. I mean, I remember so specifically my dad just jumping around the house because 
he had just refied into a 9%. He was out of the double digits and he yeah, was right. so excited. Oh, and when wow. we started, I think it was sevens, eights. Um, you know, and we just didn't think twice about it because we were kind of looking from the perspective of my dad. It was like, oh my gosh, it's even better than nine, which he was so excited about. So the last couple of years were unusual. Uh, we won't probably see those rates again unless, you know, that something really bad happens. So yeah. don't wish for those kind of low rates because it means yeah. it comes with a tough economy. But a solid, normal, stable economy is, you know, five, six percent is super normal. And you can mm -hmm. still get that today if the seller is um, paying down your points, which we're seeing a lot. So in answer to your question, there's going to be all kinds of opportunity. Uh, we know that builders are now, you know, again, paying points um, to lower your mortgage and even reducing costs in some cases. So you could still get those nice new homes, which make wonderful rentals. I mean, if you're going to own a property out of state, why would you not want a new home? You know, there's just going to be less problems that the insurance is lower. Uh, it's just easier to maintain, easier to rent out, right? Um, so you can now get discounts on those properties that you couldn't get last year and yeah. points bought down. Uh, but there's also going to be more um, existing homes uh, as more inventory comes on the market. But it's so interesting. People keep saying there's going to be more in inventory on the markets. But in the markets that we've been focused on, it's not really the case, maybe a tiny bit more. But the National Association, the National Association of Realtors just came out with a a new report saying there's still bidding wars out there. Prices are still holding solid because people, I think it's like 30% of homeowners are in a loan that's under 2%. Mm -hmm. Another 30% under, under, not under 2%, I'm sorry, under 3%. Four. They're oh, in the three, two. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And so 30% in the 2% range, 30% in the 3%, and, and then 4%. I mean, people are, today's homeowners are looking so good. Their payments are so low and so much lower than rents, or if they were to trade their home for another home, they're just not going to. They're going to stick yeah. with what we have. So the idea that there's going to be a whole bunch of new inventory on the market, is just not happening. Listings, new listings are down. Builders are pulling back. So there's even less inventory. So anyway, bottom line, in the markets that we're in, we're not seeing a whole lot of new inventory, but a little bit. And a little bit is better than what we were seeing last year, where there were some markets where there was nothing. There yeah, was yeah. that nothing was the available. biggest problem. The inventory yeah. is the biggest problem. Yeah. So there's one other part to that question was, what does Real Wealth do to help investors? Um, we talked about how we get paid. Um, um, so basically, it's you know so you kind of spoke to it a little bit, but we have property teams around the country that we have connected with. We looked at their the quality of their rehabs or the quality of their new builds. Um, we've done background checks on these property teams and brokers, and also all, researched their market to make sure it's an emerging market, it's growing, that people are moving there, that businesses are moving there, and once we bring on a new team. Right now we have about 15 different property teams and brokers that we refer to. Basically that's the way we help our members is we provide a ton of free education on how to invest uh, if they haven't done it before. And then we have investment counselors, all experienced investors who have at least five years experience investing, have portfolios of their own, have invested through our property teams. And they are there to sit down with our members and our investors. And it's free to be a member at Real Wealth. Um, they will sit down and find out uh, your goals, what you're looking for, and then help direct you to these property teams and the markets that are going to be the best fit for your goals and what you're looking for. Make the introduction and then you're connected with these property teams. And then the property teams and the brokers can show you the inventory they have, answer any questions. You can even fly out to the market if you want to look at the properties, walk through them and all that. So I think that's, that's the main thing. Yeah, it's, a, it's really a service to people who don't live in an area where they can get cash flow property yeah. or they're just simply too busy. They have they have a job already. They don't need another job. Uh, on top of that, they've got family and health and things, relationships. They don't have time to buy a property, renovate it, uh, manage it. That's that's kind of like, do you, are you going to buy an old car and fix it yourself? Or are you going to buy a new car? Or do they don't have, yeah, have some people love to buy old cars and fix them up. Yeah, but then yeah. that's their hobby. But yeah, yeah, busy working professionals who want to spend more time with their family or their do their other hobbies. Yeah, it's a little bit more done for you. 
Yeah, it, it has to be. Or people mm -hmm. out of the country, right? They just can't come and do that. So making it a, we've worked with the, some of these teams for over 10 years now. We mm -hmm. have incredible trust. They trust each other. In fact, it was probably five years ago that uh, some of our teams that we work with came to us and said, you know, we want to be involved in who you bring on to real wealth. And because we want to all look good because mm -hmm. if, if somebody has a bad experience with one property team, they're not going to want to work with us, you know? Mm -hmm. So they said, can we be involved and, and help you vet these teams and then help each other get better? Because there might be a property team, let's say in Atlanta, that's really good at finding properties, but maybe their property management wasn't so great. But our whole Ohio team has excellent property management and they know a lot. They've got experience. So they said, can we, can we get together and share this information? So now we do monthly masterminds where they come together and share best practices. They help each other. They're competitors, but they just want everybody to, to be their best um, yeah. for the sake of the investor. So with that said, we have tremendous faith in the teams that are that we refer people to and that are on realwealth.com. But you still got to do your due diligence as an investor. You every property is different. Every property is different. So regardless of how good the team is, you still got to do get your inspections, you got to get your appraisals to make sure that you really know what you're getting. Yeah, that's uh, the fundamentals. Yes, <laughs> that's real fundamentals. estate investing 101, right? Anything. Yeah. Always do we do that due diligence no matter what. If you're yeah. finding it on your own or through an agent or a broker or through real wealth, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, like due diligence on your hairdresser as well, which is why I have these bangs. <laughs> <laughs> I did not research my hairdresser well enough and she chopped my bangs. Yeah, you're but still beautiful. Two, two weeks from now I'll have I'll have normal hair again. <laughs> <laughs> you're funny. Okay, so there was something you spoke to about, let's see, that that fit in to one of these. Oh, here it is. Um your thoughts, you, you just talked about the market and what's happening and, uh, and not only investments, but also just in primary residence. So your thoughts on buying a primary residence versus an initial investment property. What are your thoughts mm -hmm. on that? There's pros and cons, right? I'm sure you've got ideas on this too. Uh, obviously, if you can buy a primary residence and afford it, that's a great way to go because you got to pay rent anyway, right? Mm -hmm. So if, if you're able to buy a home, a primary residence, and the mortgage payment is close to what you'd pay in rent, by all means, do it, especially because you get the better interest rate on your primary and you can put less down. You can put 3% down on your primary. You're going to pay mortgage insurance, but it's still very little money out of pocket. And if you buy right and you're able to put an ADU on the property or um, you know, rent a portion of your property, then you get both. You get an investment property and a primary, especially yeah. if you get a duplex or a triplex or fourplex. I mean, we've been doing that our whole lives. Yeah, Today, we have. <laughs> yeah, we have two ADUs that we rent on our property and it kind of covers everything. So uh, it's really um, just depends on the property. Now, if you are going to have to put down a massive down payment that you don't have and the payment is more than you pay in rent, you might want to rethink it and maybe take the money instead. Um, you know, let's say it's two hundred thousand, three hundred thousand dollars you have to put down on a, a property in California because a million dollars is the median home price. Mm. Uh, so if you have to put that kind of money down, um, you could you could buy a whole lot of rental properties, and the income from those rental properties could pay for your rent, right? And yeah. and then you'd be diversified, and you have more write offs on investment properties than you would on your primary. So there's pros and cons to both. But for somebody who's just sitting in a high price market saying, I'm never going to own real estate because I'll never afford it here. Yeah. And by all means, your first property can be an investment property. A lot of people don't realize that. Yeah, It does not have to be your primary as your first. They just want to know that, in fact, it's easier to buy an investment property because you get to use the rental income to help qualify you. So if you're buying a $200,000 property, that's $40,000 down. You get to use the rental income to qualify. Um, if you buy right, and today you certainly can, soon enough, you'll be able to refi and get all your money back out and go do it again. Nice. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's an, it depends and it depends on your own financial analysis really of it. It's like really laying it out and just saying, what's, 
what's my long term goal here? You know, and what is it? What kind of rent would I get? What kind of cash flow would I get from getting an investment property? Um, there's one piece about getting that first investment property is a game changer for mindset. And I've seen it so many times with our investors, with our friends, that once you buy that first investment property, all of a sudden something, you know, happens in a moment. You know, most things don't happen in a moment, big changes. They're little things, actions over time. So you kind of slowly grow your confidence or your knowledge or something. But mindset happens in a moment. And it when and it can be that moment when you first own that investment property, you say, I'm an investor now, and you start seeing things in a whole new way. That's a mindset shift. And that's a, that's in fi financial intelligence. So that's one of the huge advantages of buying your first investment property. But I mean, an example is like our first property that we bought was our, pr our primary residence, and it was $547,000 in the San Francisco Bay Area. This is 1997, but we couldn't afford that mortgage. However, it had two lower units that we converted. One was a granny unit, one was an office with a laundry room and had a shower and everybody because it was a construction uh, guy that, that built the house. And so we converted that into an apartment. So we had two apartments in the lower level. We lived in the beautiful upper level and we were able to make ends meet. So, you know, absolutely looking at that primary residence and saying, well, I can put down less down on this. I can rent out, you know, when you're looking at properties and touring them, look at that. Just like our daughter did. You walk through and you say, wait a minute, this could be converted into an Airbnb, you know, it has a separate entrance or so it's like open your mind and open your eyes to new possibilities of how you might be able to monetize that house if it is your primary residence. And then we have a friend who basically buys a primary residence, a new one every two years, because you got that $500,000 credit that you can make, you know, $5,000 in profit on that. And it's tax free. You get to keep that, roll it into your next property if you're or married. whatever you want to do with that. If you're married, you get 500. You get right 000. for the 500, for the mm -hmm. 500, right. If you're single, it's 250, but mm -hmm. it's a, it's one of the best tax, uh, tax savings you can have is yeah, that incentives. all that gain mm -hmm. tax incentives. Yeah. All that gain is tax free. Yeah. So our friend, um, uh, who a lot of people probably know, um, James Daynard, he, he does that. He lives in a different house. I wouldn't want to live in a different house every two years. Although it seems like we have, <laughs> <A lot. laughs> I know it's going to happen. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. So anyway, so that's, that's, I think that's, that was the main thing about primary residence versus an initial investment property. It really depends. It depends on your goals, your long-term goal, your financial position, uh, where you are, where you're living in the country, all that. And I think the average median home price is like 420 now, right? And the United States overall. You would put, pick that number, but yes, it's probably around there. Yeah, it might be 421. <laughs> yes, I would pick that. Okay, next one. Um, how does an investor choose a market? Wow. It's a, such a good question. Well, fortunately for you, Real Wealth has a lot of information on different markets. Mm. You just go to realwealth.com, click on the invest tab. You'll see a whole drop down of different markets and why we like them. So you'll have some homework to do because you'll have to decide out of all those awesome markets, which one you like the most. Um, you know, you just, uh, that's a really tough question, Rich. I, I well, let me, let me ask you a different way. Um, Cause to this, how do you choose a market? What do you look for before you would invest in a market? Well, you know that I'm a little bit more aggressive in investment and I still consider myself young, even though uh, maybe I'm not as much as I you used are. to be. Because, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Um, but I still like to be aggressive. So I like growth markets because I like appreciation because I'm born and raised in California. So I don't want just cash, cash flow properties. Mm -hmm. So for me, I want to be in areas where I know there's job growth, where I know there's population growth, where it's still affordable and where there's infrastructure growth. This to me is you get it all. You get cash flow and appreciation because if you're ahead of the path of progress, you're kind of there before everybody gets there. You know, it's go growing. You know, there's freeways coming in, hospitals, schools, and that wave is going to take you. And of course, I compare a lot of things to surfing, but think mm -hmm. about it. If if you're if you're just timing things really well with this wave coming and it just takes you along and you get this amazing ride, why would you not do that instead of having to work really hard to catch a wave? So I, I love um, Florida, Texas. These are really growth areas. Anywhere in the Southeast yeah. is growing. With that said, um, there are parts of the country that aren't typically growth areas, but 
parts of the area are growing mm. or there's just simply not enough new construction. So prices have been going up. It's been shocking that in the markets that we've promoted in Ohio, they have seen 20% price gains because there's simply no new supply coming on, but you have a, a growing millennial prop population forming households. So I, I do like to offset the lower cash flow areas, the, the growth areas with the Midwest, you know, Ohio. Um, we've got some great teams in Indianapolis is a great market. Um, yeah. Oh, Cleveland, Cleveland. We've got a wonderful new team there that our investors rave about. Baltimore has been kind of both, you know, it's been a great cash flow and potential appreciation market because again, how much, how much more can you build in Baltimore? You know, that city's built out. So to, to get in there over time, you know, there's, there's cash flow and growth. Yeah. And then I would add on to that just because we did go through the downturn 2008, 2009 and hit us hard. And the one of the big mistakes that we made was leveraging negative cash flow properties. So we were, you know, paying more for the property than our monthly rent. So we were in negative cash flow. Uh, I would highly advise against that unless you have a huge amount of reserves and you can float through a downturn or anything like that. Um, you can lose control of the property and that's, it's, it's keeping control of the asset through any type of downtown turn or recession. So it, it just, I would say, make sure that any investment makes sense from the day you buy it, even if it's $5 a month, $10 a month, positive cash flow, but just never get into a, you know, a negative cash flow situation. Yeah. I wrote about that in my book, retire rich with rentals, which by the way, I have revised and it yeah. is now on Amazon, the new book that's brought to current numbers. It was like a really outdated. Yeah, uh, he wrote it in 2014. So yeah, there's been yeah. some changes. Yeah. So I really updated the numbers and the stories. Um, and in there, I talk about how I was too attached to uh, one of our California houses that was highly negative cash flow, but I didn't want to sell it. We'd raised our kids there. And so we kept it. And wow, that property probably lost, uh, you know, at half its value half its value yeah. and was still negative cash flow. So that yeah. was a tough time. Don't do that. Right. Negative yeah. cash flow properties are no fun. All right. All right. So that was choosing a market. Um, do you, re do you recommend a single family or a duplex for a first time investor? Oh my gosh. I'll just answer saying it depends. Uh, just look at the numbers. Uh, a duplex can probably cash flow better and you get one loan and two doors, you know, so you can, mm. you can build more doors that way. Uh, I, you know, we have duplexes, they've done great. We have single family, they've done great. Generally the single family appreciate more. Uh, and that's, like I said, that's, I, I like appreciation. So I want to be in neighborhoods where there's good schools and, um, low crime and where people are going to want to live and they're going to bid on that property and really want that property. Uh, that's generally not the case for a duplex. When it comes time to sell, you're probably going to sell to an investor. So yeah. they, it just depends on how long you plan to hold it. And But you're definitely going to cash flow more, most likely on a duplex or a fourplex. And yeah, I think and I just heard we've got potentially some new ones. So definitely talk to the investment counselor that you're working with at Real Wealth because I just heard there's some really good ones coming. Yeah, that's perfect. And also can be that model going back to the, you know, primary residence, you know, some some investors, I've met a lot of people who will buy a duplex, they'll live in one side, they'll rent out the other until they get to, you know, they're building their portfolio, they're creating enough cash flow to be able to just have their own primary residence, their dream home or whatever they want. And then they can just rent out the other the other side and just have this mm -hmm cash flowing asset over time. I know you and I have, we'd love our, our duplex since, you know, it's been our highest yielding investment property that we own. So yeah, it's, it depends, but, and I've also heard it's, it's a little more challenging to sell a duplex than a single family. I mean, kind of like mm -hmm. you said, usually it's going to be an investor who's going to buy the duplex, right? Right. And they usually yeah. want a deal. <laughs> yeah. So it depends if you're looking to liquefy and sell, sell it off in the future, or if you're looking to hold it for the long term, uh, which is, ten, we tend to lean toward the, the long term picture. Mm -hmm, yeah. For sure. Yeah.
All right. Um, what proportion is a challenging one to answer specifically? What proportion of the members of Real Wealth break even or are cash flow positive after all their costs? We would not be in business if they were just breaking even. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah. Our our members are you know, our whole thing is cash flow. We would we would be promoting California property if we, if we didn't think that. Um, <laughs> Good point. <laughs> so it's got a cash flow. Obviously, that's much harder to do with today's interest rates. But one of the things that we've talked about many many times, and I think now we have a way to show this on a spreadsheet. But you never want to look at year one cash flow and and think that that's your cash flow because year one is literally the worst year you're going to have. Hopefully, you know, I mean, things can always change and um, you can have, you know, issues with an, with an older home. But um, you in your first year, you're paying you're paying closing costs. Uh, rents haven't gone up yet. You're just getting today's rents. But over time, you know, our investors think about our investors who bought. 15 years ago, you know, who trusted us and mm. bought or 20, almost 20 years ago now mm, in Rockwell, Texas, <laughs> you know, where the, the rent was 1200 back then. Now it's, I don't even know. It's much, much higher. And the, the homes are worth three to four times what they paid. So it's, it's a long-term game. Uh, people, when you lock in your interest rate, the only time you're going to change your interest rate is if you're going to get it cheaper, right? You're going to refi and get a lower lower mortgage or lower payment. Um, and that increases your cash flow. But over time, over time, your rents are going to go up because there's inflation. Inflation is not going away. The Fed mm -hmm. is trying to fight it. But when you look at any chart, any chart at all, look at housing prices over the last 30 years, look at rents over the last 30 years, look at the S&P over the last 30 years, look at anything, bread, milk. I mean, yeah. it's all more expensive. Inflation is here. And so over time, your rents go up, but you're locked into a fixed rate on your payment. And that's that's where the money is made. So people who have held, believe me, they're cash flowing more and more and more every single year. Yeah. Yeah. It's incredible. Yeah. You know, and we went to BPCon this and just, just a few months ago, I guess it's just a month ago. Uh, down in San Diego, Bigger Pockets Conference. And David Green gave the opening keynote. He's the host of the Bigger Pockets podcast. And uh, man, I walked out of that keynote just like, where else can we buy? <laughs> you know, and it's mm -hmm. like, and, and he, there was no agenda for him. He was just showing that, just seeing the charts over time and what happens with real estate, what happens with our economy, what happens with inflation, and what that means about getting in the game. It's like the sooner you can get in the game, the better. And it's like that old saying, the best time to buy real estate was 20 years ago, right? <laughs> Second best time is today. It's like, you just got to make it happen. You got to do it. And this is a really, really incredible window opportunity because there is so much fear. I'm going to be doing a webinar pretty soon um, that's going to show some really exciting slides that, you know, we're going to be okay. Like we're going to come out of this. Um, there's a pause right now where people are afraid and yeah. there's not competition, which is why I started the single family rental fund in Texas, because mm -hmm. we're raising money. Uh, we're going in and buying properties, all cash, and there's no competition. So we're getting incredible discounts and people who want to be completely passive and just let us do the work are really happy about that because they don't have to do any of the fixing or the acquisition or getting the loans or anything, just invest in the fund and we do the work for you. So if you want to find out about that, that's at growdevelopments.com grow, G-R-O-W, growdevelopments.com. You do need Perfect. to be accredited to invest in that. Um, you'll find out what accredited means if you don't know on the Grow Developments website. And if you want to build your own portfolio, by all means, go to realwealth.com. Join. It's free if you haven't already. And you'll be able to talk to one of our investment counselors or um, and or look at the drop down of different markets all across the country and you get to Know, get to know the teams and, and see what's available. One of the best things you can do right now in any market is, is educate yourself, is learn, learn, learn. So that's what the Real Wealth Show is all about. That's why we provide so much free education at Real Wealth. Every week we do an educational webinar. We've produced 
almost a thousand free educational webinars for our members. Uh, so that is exactly what this show is about. And so this is kind of newer as far as taking questions. So if you have any questions that you would want answered uh, about the market, the economy, about investing, how will you operate, anything like that, please just uh, leave comment, leave a comment here or uh, shoot over to realwealth.com and let us know what questions you'd like to ask um, us on The Real Wealth Show. And Kathy and I will do another one of these if you think it's a good format. All right, Rich, thank you for joining me here on The Real Wealth Show. It's always fun to have you here. Always fun to be here. Thank you. And thank you for joining us here. Again, you can go to realwealthshow.com and get access to all those goodies, lots of educational webinars and access to the property teams and investment counselors. I'm Kathy Betke. Thanks so much for joining me here on The Real Wealth Show. We'll see you next time. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are provided for informational purposes only and should not be construed as an offer to buy or sell any securities or to make or consider any investment or course of action. For more information, go to realwealthshow.com.